that same page, ghost of person killed in accident, seen at death or burial spot. And then, you know, you see that uh, Thompson identifies uh, the sources and you would go to the bibliography to find the Richard Bauman book in which this particular motif is identified or at the top of the left, dead father's friendly return um, is a motif. It's a motif that is commonly found in folk literature, myths, legends, or folk tales. Next slide. All right, so um, I'm going to turn it turn the podium over uh, to Levi, who's going to talk more about the depths of QAnon and its folkloric roots. Yeah. So, hi everyone. I'm Levi. Um, I was tasked in our in our article to kind of fall myself a little bit into the QAnon rabbit hole, as you say. Uh, go through some of the uh, the Q drops uh, that have been posted online that you know people read, people take and uh, draw their own meaning from, go on their uh, QAnon uh, quote unquote research uh, and, and go through the internet. But uh, before I get into the motifs of QAnon, I think, uh, I think we all have maybe uh, have heard of QAnon at this point. It's kind of permeated and penetrated the, the mainstream to a certain extent. Uh, but I would like to, you know, go a bit into how QAnon started, uh, some of the beliefs they have. I, I have a few examples of the Q drops uh, that, I'll, that I'll also show as an example and, and kind of how Q, uh, QAnon operates. Uh, so it finds its roots in 2017 uh, when an anonymous user uh, by the name of Q who tagged his, his post on, uh, with Q, he posted on the website 4chan, uh, starting this kind of grand conspiracy um, claiming that, um, that there were deep state officials, uh, liberal elites, Hollywood elites, uh, working within the government, uh, working in, in the broader mainstream, uh, basically trafficking children uh, across the country and around the globe. Uh, and these, these elites were basically abusing these children, uh, still are to this day, uh, and that they are actively siphoning their blood uh, using what they call adrenochrome from the children uh, as a sort of drug or to prolong their life. There's various various interpretations what, what people believe with that. Um, and this this person, this individual or perhaps multiple people called Q, uh, the Q stands for this Q clearance that one uh, can obtain in the Department of Energy. So it's believed or thought to be believed by adherence to QAnon that this person is working actively inside the government. And the, the grand goal is that um, Donald Trump, through prophecy, um, do being elected uh, and working within the government is actively rooting out behind the scenes with uh, his administration, these deep states, liberal elite officials um, that are trafficking these children uh, that you know, are committing this grand uh, heinous conspiracy. And that one day, uh, all these these people involved in, in the conspiracy will be rooted out, and they will be uh, summarily executed in a, an event they call the Great Awakening. Um, and that will kind of be this moment of enlightenment where uh, everything, you know, kind of topples into place. And it's honestly not really clear what happens after that. You know, if, if there's some grand utopia that arises after that, or, or what have you. Uh, but that's that's the core belief of QAnon. Um, it stems a bit earlier uh, from this other conspiracy called Pizzagate, and many people who uh, follow QAnon and believe in QAnon also believe in Pizzagate. And Pizzagate uh, was this uh, also trafficking conspiracy that there is this uh, pizza parlor in Washington, D.C. that actually exists, Comet Ping Pong, uh, that, uh, that is trafficking children through the basements and that the, mainly the Clintons and, and other liberal elites are involved in this, this, this trafficking. And this actually led to uh, real world consequences. You had this uh, armed man come and show up at Comic Ping Pong uh, in 2016 and uh, hold it up. And I don't, uh, no one was killed or injured, I don't think, but uh, it was a major standoff and, and broke the news. Um, now, Comet Ping Pong doesn't actually have a basement. Uh, it's one thing, but um, this, this kind of sparked this whole um, you know, grand conspiracy of, of child trafficking uh, throughout the world. Um, so those are kind of like core beliefs of QAnon, but QAnon um, 
I, I, I almost hesitated to call it a conspiracy because over the past year, especially, it's kind of become an umbrella for other conspiracies. It's drawn um, believers of other conspiracies in and has kind of adopted uh, additional conspiracies that some choose to believe and others choose to omit uh, as they see fit. So some of other uh, some of the other periphery periphery beliefs um, are like uh, David Icke s conspiracies that the world leaders of the world are actually lizard people and aliens, uh, you know, controlling from another planet uh, that need to be rooted out and and, and whatnot. Um, flat earthers find a place in, in QAnon. Uh, there's a conspiracy that Obama was a Saudi royal plant in the 2008 election, and it's all or, that's all been orchestrated and you know kind of like a moving from the birtherism uh, conspiracy uh, during Obama's uh, term in office. So that's that's kind of example of, of what QAnon believes. Um, uh, they operate um, primarily online. So I, I mentioned that QAnon was founded on, started on 4chan, um, but since, uh, but since uh, 4chan has banned QAnon from, from posting on there, they moved to uh, a site called 8chan. Uh, and many of you might not know about 8chan. 8chan is probably the biggest cesspit of the internet that ever exists. So you find white supremacists, uh, extremists, domestic terrorists. It's, it's, a, it's the lowest point of the internet I think you can go. Um, but that's where uh, the Q drops uh, are found now. Um, they've actually changed names. Uh, uh, 8chan was actually forced to shut down. Um, they, uh, they were the site where the uh, the uh, the domestic terrorist that uh, um, committed the act at the Orlando this Orlando uh, nightclub mass shooting a few years back uh, he posted his uh, uh, his memorandum on on 8chan and uh, and since then they've shut it down and another site has opened up called 8kun and that's where all the Q drops are now so it's basically the same thing it's run by the same guy um, so that's that's where they post now. Uh, however, I, I have not been on 8kun, but uh, they post also through another proxy site called QAlerts, and QAlerts is very accessible. It's a very accessible site, um, and this this basically reposts all the Q drops, all the posts that Q makes, um, into a very digestible site uh, with also tabs on the side for resources. Um, a lot of like Q drops have cryptic names uh, referring to certain people, and they have like a list of resources and uh, you know acronyms and whatnot. Uh, also, video links to YouTube videos, many of which have been taken down now, uh, but that also have certain conspiracy elements within them. Um, yeah. Now, Q, like uh, the conspiracy itself, how people interact with it is very specific and very different from a lot of other conspiracy theories. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of times with certain conspiracies, people passively believe in them. Um, they might. You know, believe aliens have, uh, you know, uh, have come to Earth, um, and and that's that. That's something they believe in. That's a conspiracy they, you know, they value and, and believe. But with QAnon, there's a lot of active participation with it. Um, I, I call this, others call this as well, uh, a gamified, uh, gamified conspiracy, um, where it requires people to actively look at the Q drops. Um, see the cryptic messages, maybe like certain letters are capitalized and maybe the spells a message, maybe certain things are in brackets and that means something. And it requires people to go through the internet and, and kind of go on their own internet scavenger hunt, what, what they call research, um, and draw their own conclusions. Um, and once someone comes to a conclusion through the Q drops, they make a post about it, they might make a video, they might make a tweet. Uh, and on, on various social media platforms, sometimes 8kun, but also uh, a lot Twitter, um, a lot Facebook, um, you know, Reddit as well. Um, and the, you know, people come to their own conclusions and uh, depending on how well received uh, certain conspiracy theories are, how many upvotes they get, how many retweets they get, um, this kind of like establishes a bit of validation with that particular theory and uh, yeah, that, that kind of like establishes itself as like, okay, this, this theory can be taken a bit more seriously than that one. If more people are, are you know, following this, if a lot more people are saying this than that, uh, that kind of becomes more canon, I guess you can say. Um, right, and it, it has breached the American and international mainstream, unfortunately. 
Uh, it's always a discussion whether we should even be talking about QAnon because you know if we talk about QAnon, we we breathe it energy, we give it life. But at the same time, um, after we've seen what happened the other week and the uh, the extent that QAnon has found itself in this radicalized element in our society, uh, it, it becomes a bit unavoidable to to ignore. Um, especially during COVID. COVID has breathed, uh, breathed tremendous life into it through its uh, various conspiracies, 5G conspiracies. Um, you have uh, this conspiracy called the Great Reset, which is very prominent now in, in QAnon. That's uh, basically the uh, people behind the World Economic Forum and liberal uh, regimes around the world are actively implementing things like mass mandates and government restrictions to, with the eventual goal to establish communist takeovers in every country in the world. Um, that's that's a, a big conspiracy now uh, within QAnon. So uh, that's why we're addressing QAnon and looking at these folkloric elements within it and seeing, okay, these conspiracies might seem absolutely ridiculous, and they are, um, but they have shown up before in history and we trace some of these motifs back to folklore. Um, Ah, yes, I have, I have a few cue drops just to, just to show as examples. Um, the one on the left is very interesting. It's posted on October 21st, and uh, it shows um, a picture of Anderson Cooper and his mother, uh, who was a Harris to the Vanderbilt family, I believe, very, very uh, wealthy, important person. Um, uh, and uh, supposedly, I, I'm not sure how much this image is doctored, if this is real or not, you know, there's never, you never know for sure. But under this uh, certain kind of, you know, picture structure on their wall that uh, somehow alludes to human sacrifice and satanic worship, you know, um, stuff like that. Um, the one on the right here uh, is just a short one. It's not about Republican versus Democrat. It's about preserving our way of life. Uh, if America falls, the world falls. Um, you know, some of these, some of these drops I put on here, um, they, they, you kind of look at them a bit differently, especially after what happened last week. Um, you see kind of the more real world implications of, you know, some of the very uh, violence and uh, kind of apocalyptic words and the uh, phrasing they use. Uh, yeah, some of these, this one on the left is actually the third QAnon post, uh, third Q drop. And uh, mainly I had this bit at the bottom shown because uh, as later we'll see, I'll talk a bit about uh, their, their use of uh, Satanism within QAnon, uh, establishing from the very beginning that many in the government worship Satan. Um, at the beginning, you have some uh, showings of like this, this kind of different wordings for certain uh, individuals that are prominent in the conspiracy. In this one, it's Rod slash Bob, and those refer to Rod Rosenstein and Robert Mueller, of course, involved with the Russian investigation. Um, yeah, this this middle one here is showing a bit of the violence. Um, it's actually Q re replying to someone replying to his previous drop. Um, and he said in his original one, 2018, will be glorious. And the guy says, will be, in my humble opinion, it already is. And Q replying, in our opinion, until those responsible are dead and or suffering, it shall remain, will be. Uh, very inflammatory. Um, and on the right here is a bit of a lengthy one again, showing uh, one of the favorite targets of, of, uh, of QAnon, George Soros. Um, also kind of hinting that, uh, you know, this is, this is a, uh, it's a conspiracy theory really targeted at, you know, a liberal kind of elite, a democratic establishment, but also uh, as, as you'll see in the next slide here, a lot of anti-Semitic undertones and overtones really. Right, so the first motif I'll go into and probably the most um, the most reported on I see uh, on media sites is that of the blood libel. Uh, the blood libel is this, it's permeated Western culture, Western society for ages. Uh, it's this accusation that, um, that Jews in particular are, uh, are they steal children and uh, siphon their blood and use it for rituals and, and their uh, Passover, for example. Um, obviously it's, clearly anti-Semitic um, and it's, yeah, completely baseless. Uh, we found this in the, the motif index um, as a Christian child killed to furnish for Jewish right, uh, V361, if you, if you wanna go look it up. Um, and uh, one of the 
first uh, mentionings of it in the motif index is this, uh, this anti-Semitic conspiracy um, that actually permeated English culture for a long time, uh, the Hue of Lincoln. Um, this references this, uh, this legend uh, of this little boy, his name was Hugh, uh, not to be confused with the, the Saint Hugh of Lincoln. They sometimes referred this, this boy as the little Saint Hugh of Lincoln. Uh, in the 13th century, he was um, uh, killed and it was, you know, was, they, they accused him of being killed by, uh, uh, of, of Jews and some 90 or so Jews in, in the town were uh, persecuted and, and killed. Um, this spurred a lot of literature and, and culture uh, in, in England. Um, famously, Geoffrey Chaucer uh, wrote about Hugh of Lincoln uh, and mentioned Hugh of Lincoln and a few of his works. Um, this is also, this was one of the first uh, recordings of this, but is actually preceded by a case of uh, William of Norwich in the mid 12th century. And this is also another case of a boy being accused of being uh, killed by Jews. Um, also baseless um, and no, yeah, no foundation to it whatsoever. Um, but it was recorded and it was one of the first recorded instances of this. Um, this blood libel uh, we found actually originates uh, even before medieval Europe. Um, it has origins in ancient Rome. Um, it's uh, with, with uh, targeted towards Christians uh, who were believed of snatching uh, uh, Roman kids and doing similar things to them. Uh, and this motif uh, found a new, uh, a, a new target, I guess you could say, towards medieval Europe. Uh, and if, of course, it's permeated uh, into modern days. It was also uh, found in Nazi Germany um, as well. And now it finds a new kind of life in QAnon um, with the siphoning of the adrenochrome from the kids, uh, the bloodletting, uh, and the use of, of of, uh, of ch children's blood for, uh, you know, drugs or prolonging their life. So uh, another, another a uh, motif that we have is that of prophecy and prophets. Um, th this, these are kind of like, um, these are a bit self-explanatory in what they are. Um, they're referenced in the motif index, you know, uh, dating back to biblical prophets, um, to uh, Jewish legends. Um, there's all sorts of uh, references mentioned in the motif index of, of prophecy and prophet. Um, this finds its, itself uh, reiterating itself in, in QAnon uh, through two people. Um, one is Q. Q kind of becomes this, this sort of new, new age uh, digitalized uh, prophet. Uh, he, you know, he is this anonymous person or many persons. Um, uh, posting these drops, and these drops harken back to kind of uh, biblical scripture at times. They're very cryptic, um, and they're up to the individual to decipher for themselves. Um, and there's a lot of imagery, uh, a biblical imagery used in Q drops. So you have uh, phrases like the great awakening, you have phrases like the storm, the plan, um, all these kind of harken back to this grand prophecy of, of you know, this eventual you know, utopia emerging from, from this conspiracy coming to its full conclusion. Um, I'd also like to note, uh, there are some, um, with, with these phrasings, there are also some anti-Semitic connotations that you can't avoid as well. The storm, um, obviously there's the, the biblical connotation you can have with that, but you can't deny that that has also um, uh, roots and harkens back to, uh, to Nazi Germany with, um, you know, they had a uh, newspaper called Der Ströme, uh, Strömabteilung, being one of the, the infamous um, uh, battalions of, of Nazi Germany. So that kind of, uh, that also has that anti-Semitic undertone with it as well. Uh, and and what, what this does, uh, this use of prophecy and prophet, it also, uh, it also makes QAnon very accessible to a religious audience. And indeed, some... Um, some churches have adopted uh, teaching QAnon in sermons and, and on their sites. Um, it's a bit concerning at times uh, seeing some of these these churches and religious organizations actually espousing QAnon belief. But uh, it's it's uh, it's not uh, it's not you know very widespread. But there are cases of it that you can find. 
Um, and lastly, I have some other common motifs here, child abduction uh, and a child sacrificed as a religious rite. Uh, these are also kind of, you know, we've, we've seen this before as well uh, in, in, you know, previously talking about QAnon, but child abduction uh, we find in Icelandic folklore, an Icelandic folk legend. Um, the child sacrifice as a religious rite, this, this brings a very interesting modern day parallel with, um, uh, with Satanism. Uh, and the prevalence of Satanism within within QAnon conspiracy, um, because not only is it believed that these these people are trafficking children uh, around and using them for you know their blood, they're also believed to be Satanists and Satan worshippers. Um, and this plays really well in uh, modern American psyche because uh, we have a very recent history with Satanism, a uh, continuous history of Satanism. We've had um, a Satanic panic happening in the 70s and 80s. Where we had a whole bunch of you know uh, child abductions as well that were tied to Satanists. Uh, you know, elite groups of people are just you know people living uh, you know in, in communities believed to be Satanists abducting children. Um, we've had uh, cultural phenomena based out of Satanism. The Exorcist happened uh, in the 70s, um, and this is pervade. Uh, this is this has lasted into modern days as well. Um, and still there is this kind of underlying fear of Satanism. Uh, we also have a broader history of fears of, you know, uh, elites kind of conducting these ritual religious rites, uh, religious practices. Um, for example, we have uh, uh, Freemasons, the Freemasonry in the country. Uh, our founders were, you know, a lot of them were Freemasons. They had uh, such Freemason meetings and uh, a lot of you know, people kind of base conspiracy theories out of that as well. We have modern phenomenon and in, in film uh, such as like uh, uh, National Treasure that, you know, explores this uh, Freemason kind of conspiracism. Uh, and so that kind of scratches a familiar itch with people. Um, and so this is not exactly something that's entirely new or foreign. It's something that we've seen before. Um, and Right, so as we've seen uh, through some of those examples of the motifs, um, QAnon's beliefs, uh, they're, not exactly, uh, they're not exactly new. Uh, they might seem new. They be, they've taken on like a new form in this digital age. Um, you have Q as a prophet who's uh, espousing everything online virtually, but we've seen prophets before. Um, we've seen acts of prophecy before, uh, and we can look through folklore uh, and, and uh, folk tales uh, and see where these uh, where these have happened in history before. Also with the blood libel, this is something that's been happening for uh, centuries, if not millennia. Uh, that's taken on different versions uh, as time passes on. And with QAnon, it's taken on this this sort of uh, elite driven conspiracy that uh, you know these people uh, way up top uh, that are so. Uh, unknown to us are using this, these children for their own nefarious ends. Um, and so how can recognizing these motifs help us understand why one might subscribe to conspiracy theories? Uh, I wanna pass this over to Jim. I, he has a, a nice slide with uh, some four functions of folklore and I think he can help us answer this. Yeah, thank you, Levi. Um, so again, you know, just to reinforce what we saw in the previous slide is, you know, you saw we, we have the words nonsense and absurd. And so we are not promoting the tenets of the QAnon conspiracy theory, uh, but um, we are trying to understand why these theories are so appealing. How are they seducing so many of our you know, fellow Americans and even throughout the world? Uh, you know, one of the key phrases that, that keeps popping up is, the, you know, the, the Washington Post and New York Times and elsewhere, they keep referring, it, keep referring to QAnon as a baseless conspiracy theory. We agree there is no basis in fact at all. Absurd nonsense. But we believe it is based in these folkloric roots. And that is one reason why it has become so appealing, especially at this time. You know, at this time, you know, we have a, we have a global pandemic. We have a pandemic of racial injustice. We have a, you know, 
economic challenges and economic uncertainty. We have climate change. When the world seems to be going to, you know, hell in a handbasket, if you'll excuse the expression, people turn to folklore for a degree of comfort. Uh, it helps them cope with a world that seems to be spiraling out of control. So I think this particular time is especially fertile ground for these nonsensical and absurd beliefs to emerge because they are in fact rooted in age old traditions. So this, uh, this slide just you know, borrows from a, a folklorist from the 1950s, William Bascom, uh, who, who identified these four primary functions. You know, what purposes does folklore serve? I mean, one, the first is entertainment or amusement. I'm not sure that applies so much to the tenets of QAnon. Um, but education, and, and by again, this is what I was saying about the informal education, like for you know, trial uh, lawyers, uh, it's their informal education. Likewise, for the adherents of QAnon, um, the folklore that is spreading throughout is their education to help them understand the world and its complexities. Uh, third function is this idea of you know, validation and reinforcement of beliefs and conduct uh, that the, the, uh, the folklore associated with QAnon gives people a way to, to validate and reinforce what they are doing. You know, that if you keep reading it, and now of course, you know, depending on what you're reading or hearing, um, it provides this reinforcement. And, but, but people who go onto the, the, the websites that Levi did, and I have to say that you know, I, was, I was very happy to delegate um, uh, to Levi his going into these Q drops and sites. I'm sure he's on many FBI lists at this time, and I'm not. So, uh, probably. Uh, probably. <laughs> um, uh, but it, you know, for those who are the, the loyal adherents, um, absurd as they as absurd as they beliefs may seem to us, uh, uh, the drops and the messages and the interpretations and the folklore that is shared provides some degree of 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 reinforcement. And then finally, you know, I think probably the, the most important function of folklore is this idea of maintaining the stability and the solidarity and the cohesiveness of your group, whatever your group may be. In this case. You know the group is the 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 QAnon adherents, but you know whatever the example of folklore is, this is a way for us to identify and to you know because all of us, especially in you know this crazy 21st century, all of us need some foundation uh, because otherwise we might just feel you know cast adrift. So being a member of a of a folkloric group gives you this foundation and identity and people with whom you can share your beliefs. Uh, so I think, yeah, we said we talked for about 45 minutes and we're right on target. I think we have another slide, Levi, of... Um, yeah, um, some some further readings, uh, sources that that we used, on, as well as just um, if, if anyone was interested in, in good sources similar or adjacent to the subject matter, uh, some of these were, were great. Some of them are articles online, some of them are books. Yeah, and I, and you know, Bill Ellis is a folklorist that may be familiar to to the fellow folklorists in the group who has done a lot of work on the study of Satanism, and his um, that second uh, item, uh, De Legendis Urbis, is the one that traces the blood libel back to ancient Rome. That where, you know, again, this is, this is what is so fascinating to folklorists is that the same legend, the same belief that you know, in in ancient Rome, the Romans were fearing the Christians, you know, this new religious, this new radical religious group that they felt was stealing, you know, abducting young Roman children and using their blood uh, as for, for the communion. And then, you know, hundreds of years later, it's the Christians who are using it against the Jews. The Jews are abducting young uh, Christian boys and girls and using their blood for ritual sacrifice, and then in the 20th and 21st century, this legend is still is still prevalent. And you know, Levi mentioned how it was used by by Nazi Germany, uh, and in you know newspapers like Die Stürmer. 
Um, and you know, used and and now we we see it uh, coming um, in QAnon. And maybe show the last slide, Levi, if people want to contact us. Um, I, I'd, I'd also like to mention uh, one one really good book uh, I have listed on here is the second from the bottom uh, from Muirhead and, and Rosenblum. This is a relatively new book that I, I really found informative uh, on on this idea of new conspiracism, and, and QAnon is mentioned well into it. Um, basically uh, hypothesizing that this new age of conspiracism like QAnon um, is, is less focused on uh, establishing, establishing their theories based on fact that they can point to and refer to similar to like uh, even 9-11 conspirators might, might do. They might uh, plan out, uh, look at resources and try to figure out exactly where the conspiracy is. Um, whereas QAnon and this new age of conspiracism it's so much more, as, as the title says, a lot of people are saying, um, and this has kind of been spurred on uh, in the last four years uh, by uh, the Trump administration, for example, saying, uh, using these exact words, a lot of people are saying that kind of becomes a thesis of this book, that this reiteration of the theory, this, this saying it again, um, kind of uh, reinforces the belief more so than pointing to actual fact. Um, it's a very informative book I'd recommend. Yes. And um, yeah, this is our contact information where you can find us. Um, Jim and I are at the Smithsonian. Um, and our article, I also gave a link to as well. If you have not read it, it's uh, our talk a little bit condensed. Um, yeah. OK. You know, I see that uh, uh, Lisa has put in the chat a question um, asking, uh, can you address the the Gnostic roots of the deep state ideas. So I'm assuming this is referring to Gnosticism, which was that you know movement from well, like second century uh, common era, though it's of pre-Christian origin. Is that what this is referring oh my, to? I don't know. I'm not sure if I uh, if I can give a good answer to that. <laughs> um, all right, well, uh, so, you know, uh, Gnostic doctrine taught that the world was created and ruled by a lesser divinity, the Demiurge, and that Christ was an emissary of the remote supreme divine being, esoteric knowledge of whom enabled the redemption of the human spirit. Uh, I don't know that the Q adherents are referring to Gnostic. Um, I don't think so. No. Um. Now, or, or, I mean, the other the other part of this question is asking if it's part of the idea of the deep state. Uh, I'm not sure hmm. that I see the connection myself. But again, I don't know that much about Gnosticism. Um, I can't say that I do either. But right. Well. <laughs> So are we opening it up for Q&A? If yes. um, folks have a, qu a question, you can raise your hand and uh, Jim or Levi will call on you. <clears throat> so I think we'll go to gallery view. Um, right, yeah. Oh yeah, I'll stop sharing. Yeah, yes. Levi, stop sharing, yeah. Okay, if we go to gallery view, it'll be a little easier. You can also use your reaction, the hand reaction. So, um, Okay, I see. I see. Ken Roseman has his hand up. Okay, yeah, Ken. Can we unmute him? And you can unmute yourself. Did that work? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, do you like to be called James or Jim? I don't know. I think we've met before. Yes, we have, Ken. Uh, you 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 attend the uh, the Folk Life Festival pretty regularly. Yes, I do. <laughs> Yeah. That's how I met him. That is how I met Lisa. That's <laughs> 20 years right. Ago. Fifteen or twenty years ago. I don't know. That is how I met her. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, um, well, just a couple of things here. Um, uh, let's see. You know, it almost seems like QAnon is almost a perversion of folk traditions in a way. But the other thing that occurred to me, being a sort of, how do we put this delicately, left-wing radical myself, I don't think that there are people sitting in rooms plotting doom but I do think that at the top levels of our society, it is entirely possible that corrupt business leaders, 
and politicians at the very least know of each other and some of them do work together and they do have common goals of maintaining their power and money. And um, I know this isn't the right time, so I have to email you about this, but I do want to know more about the Folkways label and if they are sending out review copies or if I should join and if there's a way to join that by just giving you a one-time sum or if it's a you know recurring thing or if there are any ways to work with that. Uh, well, yes, I mean, to address your last question, uh, uh, Smithsonian Folkways, they do have a, um, have a membership uh, option. And Ken, if you can't find it online, you know, you can email me or contact me and I will give you the link mm -hmm. about Folkways. But I, I want to address the first thing you said about, you said how, um, you know, QAnon may be a perversion of folk tradition. And this is something I would like to address is that, you know, I think for a lot of people, folklore always sounds positive and benign. Mm. That, you know, isn't it, you know, great that we have these folk traditions and, and certainly we at the Smithsonian Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage, much of our work is to honor folk traditions and to, you know, honor the practitioners who may not be well known. Uh, likewise, uh, one of our fellow agencies here in Washington, D.C., the, the National Endowment for the Arts has something called the National Heritage Fellowships in which they honor master practitioners. And I, you know, I saw before we had someone from the um, uh, ACTA, the Alliance of California Traditional Arts, where they honor um, uh, exemplars of folk traditions. But at the same time, there is, there is and always has been a dark side to these folkloric traditions. It's not all um, positive. And, and, that, and these are the traditions that, uh, that we are calling attention to. Recently in our Folklife magazine, um, we had an article about some of the artifacts and traditions from, from Jim Crow America in which uh, people would share these, um, well, of course, you know, we don't have to talk about jokes and songs that are racist, but, but in this case, there were these horrible stereotypes of African-Americans that were shared among members of groups without continual corrective reference to a fixed source. They were promoting the idea that African-Americans were inferior. Uh, so, you know, again, it's, um, yes, I mean, I, 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 I would, I'm not sure if I would, yeah, I, I think we can say that, that uh, QAnon is certainly a perverse uh, or a perversion, but it's, uh, this often goes hand in hand with a lot of folklore. And as, as Levi was saying, a lot, of, a lot of the folklore in Nazi Germany was, was directed at uh, the Jews in Europe as a way of seeking their extermination. So using folkloric ideas is one reason why those ideas took such a powerful hold on people. Because you know, getting back to our functions, it was reinforcing, re, uh, sorry, reinforcing and validating their folk beliefs. I you know there's a new okay. thing now called folk horror. I don't know if you're aware of that. And you also mentioned Little Sir Hugh. And the first time I encountered that was on Steel Eye Span's album Commoner's Crown, but it was a very cleaned up version. And you know, only over the years have I learned more about the origins of that thing. Because I love Steel Eye Span and always will, you know. Yeah, I see. Um, uh, Levi, did you want to respond to Ken's comment? Well, I just wanted to make a comment uh, on the second half of your first comment. Uh, uh, you know about obviously the the frustrations uh, and you know the the believing in QAnon, this QAnon conspiracy of the elites. Obviously, it's uh, it, it can be as we've seen a very dangerous way of expressing. Frustration, but nonetheless, uh, I think uh, it, it also resonates at least some real frustration people are having with a disconnect, uh, at, at least from uh, what they perceive as a, a system working against them. Uh, and it's always a matter of you know channeling uh, that energy and those feelings into the right place, towards the right direction, and not towards conspiracy theories of believing children are being, you know, their blood are being sucked from them. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I see Greg Lewis has a question. That's our friend Greg from Washington Revels. Good to see you again, Greg. You too, Lisa. 
um, either to to Jim or Levi. Um, I don't want to to root things or or um, you know focus too much on definitions, but I think it might be functional to ask the question of to what extent either Q or the Q drops um, uh, and however many Qs there are um, function as a fixed source for this movement, in which case uh, it doesn't take away at all from the various folkloric background to it, but does it change the the way, it, is there an operative uh, result, an operative ramification to that, that it makes this different than than just a kind of a standard word of mouth kind of kind of thing? Yeah. Um, well, yes, it's a good point, uh, Greg. And um, certainly uh, a posting on the internet is a fixed source. But to me, what is key is, are you making continual corrective reference? Or you know, do you read it in the drop, or do you read it on your Facebook feed, or do you read it somewhere and then just kind of share it, promote it, distribute it? Uh, that to me is what makes it more folklore. So Have there been any not a continual corrective reference, you know, as if it's you know the kind of the holy gospel, and and maybe in some cases it is, but I'd say not for everybody, mm. which is why I consider this. Uh, process of distribution folkloric. It may be hard to do, but are there, have there been studies of how individuals who subscribe and ascribe to, to this, how they operate? Do they actually turn back to the source or is it just this wash of, of, uh, of uh, you know, person to person kind of things without, without uh, going back to the, to, to a right. Source, so uh, referring to the source is it, 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 I mean, it is part of the, the quote unquote Q research. Um, you know, uh, for example, you know, you look on, uh, if you look on Q alerts now, um, he was done something called going dark, which basically means he has not posted. Uh, he has not posted since December 8th, at least last I checked, I checked earlier today because, you know, that's who I am now. Um, and uh, he, it, it says on there, uh, you know, Q has gone dark for X amount of days, uh, and you know, in the meantime, do your Q research. Uh, go back and read old, uh, old drops. You know, refer to old drops, uh, and and you know, do your own thing. Um, so, I mean, in that sense, yeah, it's kind of like you know, you're kind of actively going back and looking at, you know, various Q drops, and and at times they kind of contradict themselves because Q uh, is very uh, forgiving and like. Uh, certain theories that don't play out, you know, some something might might not work out in the end, and it just kind of gets forgotten and pushed to the side and like never, uh, you know, just completely put to the wayside. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, for example, like the relationship with Paul Manafort, that's uh, kind of been something that's like, back and forth and like, okay, is Manafort like an actual sleeper agent who was inserted in or is he actually like the good guy? It's it kind of, uh, it's never too consistent. Yeah, and also that's, you know, that, that people may go back to those drops, but there are always new interpretations. You know, that right. you know, especially right. after what happened on January 6th, people are now reinterpreting yes. you know, drops that were made in 2018 or 2019. It's taken on new meaning, and it, you know, and it's those interpretations which are always changing. So, you know, even though there may be, you know, this, the fixed source of the drop, the, the folklore, is always changing and folklore always has variants because you know people will have different interpretations and they may remember it differently and they may emphasize different things about what they have seen or heard one one interesting bit of of new folklore that has developed uh, at least, and believed by at least some q q adherents um is uh I, i've seen this before it's kind of crazy um they've gone back and found pictures of Donald Trump uh, in his basketball days in high school. And whether the picture was, was shopped or not, uh, it's, it's you know, unknown, but his, his jersey had the number 17 on it. And 17 is of course, the 17th letter of the alphabet is, uh, is Q. And so that's part of the grand prophecy of, of Donald Trump, you know, being elevated to this position. He was born for this particular moment in, in his life, so. Yeah. We, we have a couple more hands up. Um, okay, Lisa. June? Also, also, oh. I got a couple of a, a couple yeah. of questions. A, a questions in the, in the chat. chat. Mm. 
Uh, yeah, so let yeah. me use, uh, um, let me read one of those right now is okay. um, uh, from Sarah. Can you discuss the appeal of secret knowledge to groups that also dismiss people with education from institutions they don't like? Um, and I would say, yeah, you know, exactly. Uh, you know, secret knowledge is what is shared among members of your group. And it's what brings your group together. It's what, you know, promotes this idea of solidarity. This is secret knowledge that your group has, that, uh, that, that your group has it and, and, that, and that only your group has, that is shared among members of your group that people who are not members of your group do not know. Um, you know, it's, um, I mean, well, I, I mentioned, you know, I'm part of kind of a Jewish American group. Uh, we talk about uh, MOTs. You know, do people who are not Jewish know what an MOT means? Probably not. It means member of the tribe. Uh, and, you know, Jews know that. And we'll talk about, you know, we'll say, you know, is she MOT? Is she Jewish? But we don't say, is she Jewish? We'll say, is she MOT? Uh, I wrote an article also about, you um, Friend, friends of Dorothy. Uh, this was part of the gay subculture. It was part of your secret knowledge. You know, you would go into a bar, see a good looking guy and say, are you a friend of Dorothy? <laughs> and if the person says, Dorothy who? Well, then you know, he's not gay. <laughs> and there's no point in pursuing this conversation. <laughs> uh, but if he says, oh yeah, I'm a very good friend of Dorothy, then you know, so that's the secret knowledge that is shared among members of a group with that, you know, um, um, you will never see that, or you would, well, not unless you read my article, it's not something you'll find in print. And, you know, like a lot of folklore, we don't know where this expression comes from. One theory is that Dorothy is Dorothy Gale, this, you know, the heroine of The Wizard of Oz, played by Judy Garland, who, of course, was an icon for, um, for gays. But one person I interviewed said he heard it before 1939, which is when the film came out. And that his theory was it refers to Dorothy Parker, who was also you know, a member of the Algonquin Roundtable, also someone who was friendly uh, to gays. But friend of Dorothy, MOT, this is part of the secret knowledge of groups. It is not shared. Every group has its folklore. So yes, uh, to Sarah, definitely. I mean, you know, that's, what's so, that's one of the things that is very appealing. Uh, Lisa, who has their hand raised? So June, June Taylor and then Karuna. Um, and you just need to unmute yourselves. June Taylor and someone else with her. I can't see the whole name. Where did they go? They may have accidentally just disconnected. Oh no, here they are. No, they Hi, are. June. Hi. Yeah, so um, actually, we, I wish I could have raised two hands because there are two of us here and each of us has a separate question. I had put a question in your chat. Um, do we have any sense of how many members of uh, QAnon there are in the United States? 17,000. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, so that's one question. And then Rob has a follow up question. Hi, my name is Rob. And my question is a little different, and that is I'm curious whether work has been done to uh, basically correlate the incidence of these kinds of conspiracies or folk uh, uh, ways uh, with economic uh, cycles, you know, where people face uh, sustained economic alienation and are looking for uh, a, uh, a person or interest or image to blame their circumstance on. And uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Has, has work been done on that that you know of? And or it could be plagues too, you know. I consider that somewhat of a downturn. Right? Yeah, that is a downturn. <laughs> well, I, I can take the first question. Um, I, I can't give you exact number. I, I'm sure you can find um, an exact number out there. I haven't actually looked myself, um, but uh, it it is it is in the millions, um, oh. unfortunately. Um, and and like a lot of the uh, the lot of a lot of these you know, uh, searches for the, how they tally the amount of people, uh, they, they usually like, um, you know, 
really round up a bunch of like social media groups or followers on follow up pages on, on Twitter or whatnot. Uh, and that's kind of how they determine that. Um, also, uh, I know you asked in the US, but in Germany, for example, where this is probably the biggest outbreak uh, of, of COVID belief outside of the US, it's reached well into uh, 150,000 people, more or less, which is also interesting. I'm personally, I, I'm very interested in, in QAnon and in, in the international uh, in international sense, um, and how it's spreading in, in Germany, um, in particular. So, uh, I can't give an exact answer, but it, it's it's like in the millions. Yeah. Wow. Um, just to address, um, everyone is sending me chats. I guess the chat is not allowing some people to write to everyone. So if you could verbally ask your question, if not, just clarify if, if you do want me to read it, because there's so many of them. Uh, Karuna, or, were you okay. finished with June's questions? June's questions, um, Levi and, Rob, and Jim uh, and I Rob. I would answer um, my question. Yeah, asking if there's been work done. Um, Correlating economic downturn, right. other catastrophes with the rise of these kind of conspiracy theories. Hmm. Um, I'm not aware of anything that has, you know, looked at uh, economic downturns. I mean, um, uh, one of my areas of interest are kind of outlaw heroes. And there is a correlation between the rise of outlaw heroes like Jesse James in the 1870s and 1880s during an economic downturn Pretty Boy Floyd and John Dillinger in the 1930s during an econ ec you know, economic downturn. But in terms of rise of conspiracy theories, that would be a fascinating study uh, to you know, try to correlate to see if there is, um, you know, to um, see if there is some correlation. Levi? I, well, um, I, I remember I'd have to look back uh, deep into my, to my PDF files, but uh, I had read a, a scientific article a few months back on like what uh what are triggers for conspiracy belief uh, it's very very exhaustive like 30 40 pages long a listing a whole bunch of of what might be triggers to conspiracy thinking um economics being one of them but uh, not exactly you know it, it's not exactly confined to that as well you, you have several other kind of external factors that can that can play into it as well um you know there's also just uh, uh, there's biological factors. Uh, some people just might psychologically be more prone to it. There's um, cultural uh, kind of factors. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or I mean, I'm just thinking of other conspiracy theories. The uh, you know the the theory about you know John F. Kennedy was not assassinated. Well, you know, several. One that uh, that there was a larger conspiracy above Lee Harvey Oswald to uh, shooting Kennedy in 1963, or that another conspiracy theory is that Kennedy wasn't killed in Dallas in 1963, but he was badly brain damaged. And so that's why Jacqueline married um, Aristotle Onassis, who owned an island off the coast of Greece. And that's where they brought the brain damaged president where yeah. he could live out his life in peace. I mean, that's a conspiracy theory or the land, you know, the fact that the US did not land on the moon in July 16, 1969, but that Stanley Kubrick or somebody shot it in a studio in Arlington, Virginia. Makes um, total sense to me. <laughs> yeah. So I don't, you know, as you know, as Levi said, there are, you know, the kind of, uh, I don't know that we can correlate these to economics. You know, there are many other factors that lead to the rise of certain conspiracy theories. Thank you very much. The most disturbing thing you told me was the number 17 because we have a son who was a star in high school and college in uh, soccer and his number was 17 the whole time. So- uh, Oh no. no. <laughs> it's not a good sign. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'm Karuna and Karuna. Uh, I don't really know much about QAnon and 
I met some relatives who were really uh, one housewife who really was into it. Uh, so my question is, what is the uh, President Donald Trump or soon to be ex-President Donald Trump have to do with this QAnon? What is his role and how do they see him in the movement? Right. Um, so, so Donald Trump is, um, he's, you know, essential for it. Um, the, the whole thought is that um, Donald Trump is basically kind of this uh, almost elevated to a godlike figure, uh, prophesized to take office. Um, and his, his sole purpose in life was to get to this position uh, to get in and to he was he's the only one who can root out um, all these people running the deep state that are running this uh, child trafficking ring. Um, yeah, he, he plays an essential role. Um, and that's, there, you know, there's debates on on whether QAnon can be actually classified as a far right conspiracy theory, simply because there are a whole there are a whole lot of different groups that are involved with it. You know, there are some, some very interesting people, you know, you have like esoterics kind of fall in this, uh, fall into this as well, but you kind of have to have this uh, core belief that Donald Trump is the one who can, you know, fight this ring. So that's kind of where the, you know, that's kind of where the, 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 the right leaning, you know, uh, label uh, comes from, but yeah, he's, he's ab absolutely, you know, uh, essential for it. Yeah, and that's also one reason why that members of QAnon were at the forefront of the attack on the Capitol last yes. Wednesday. Yes. Uh, some some instances of uh, some you know some of the people that were like caught on on some of these very you know the the photos circulated around a lot. Um, uh, there was this one photo of the guy who actually sat uh, was it at uh, where where Mike Pence was presiding over the Senate. Uh, for, for the, the calling of the electoral votes. And this guy was sitting behind the desk and there's this other woman to the side of him showing her uh, showing him her phone. And they arrested her the other day. And she was actually a, uh, a former student therapist at a high school um, who quit her job saying that uh, her, her purpose in life now is to uh, expose the deep state and, and, and expose the child trafficking ring. Uh, it's kind of crazy. Like, you know, just your, your run of the mill uh, local school therapist. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, the, 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 um, um, the woman who was shot by Capitol police, Ashley yes. Babbitt. Yes. Uh, that's, last yeah. Wednesday, she, she had also turned to become a strong QAnon adherent. And she was at, you know, she was the reason she was shot is she was the first person trying to crawl through the window into the speaker's lobby of the, of the Capitol. And mm -hmm. she was shot in the process. And that become very dangerous, I guess. That's a uh, few, right? Like she seemed like so normal in every respect and suddenly her brain, she just become brainwashed. Like she's completely like brainwashed to believe something. So like, you know, that's just so unbelievable. But thank you so much for this, um, this uh, forum. Thank you. Yes. Someone asked in the chat if there, if you would describe or how you would correlate this to a cult. Well, cult, uh, kind of a, a cult to me is a very imprecise term. You know what? You know, were <laughs> uh, the early Christians were a cult, right? Uh, you know, from the perspective of the Romans. Um, mm -hmm. So it's yeah, I you know Charles Manson's group followers, James Jones. Uh, the word is used a lot, but I I I, I find it um, imprecise. You know, our yes. you know followers of a Korean <laughs> pop group cult. You know, it's cult. Mm -hmm. We sometimes say say cult like, um, but and and also you know in terms of size, you know as as Levi said, the you know QAnon adherents are in the millions that may be beyond what we can describe as cult. I, yeah. um, I have a very good question that was directly messaged to me. I, I, I don't know uh, what, what the, uh, if, if I can answer it or uh, if we should let some of the others go first, but. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, go ahead, yeah. Um, Tracy asked me uh, regarding my, my mentioning of, of QAnon spreading to Germany, why would Germans think Trump is their savior? Um, it, this, that's a, it's a fantastic question. Um, without going too much into depth of, of 
like some German conspiracy groups and, and right-wing groups, um, the idea of, of this kind of uh, elite cabal of, of people working against uh, the interest of the people by, you know, uh, exploiting children and, and whatnot, that fits really well into the narrative of some right-wing extremist uh, German groups. For example, the famous, uh, very infamous group, the Reichsburger, um, they believe that Germany is not an independent country. They believe that um, the Bundestag in Germany is, um, you know, uh, is being pulled by the strings of America and it's not, it's not actually a real, uh, a real country. And that the only real return to the country is going back to uh, the German Reich. Um, so they kind of see Trump as, you know, this, this person who's actively, you know, working, uh, working to expose the cabal. Yeah. Um, you know, I got a, a, actually uh, uh, two questions in the chat that are that are similar, uh, which is uh, one from Dolores about are there any lessons from the past on how conspiracy theories like QAnon can be debunked? And then, um, yeah, then also from Tracy, how is the folklore exposed and people start to turn away? Those are also great questions. Now, you know, we at the Smithsonian, we believe in the power of education. Um, you know, the Smithsonian was established in 1846 to, quote, promote the increase in diffusion of knowledge. So on my optimistic days, I like to think that if we provide people with, you know, accurate, reliable information, they are able to make their, you know, make a reasonable decision and realize that what they've been reading about QAnon is absurd and ridiculous. You know, through the power of education, we can help people reach their own decisions, you know, because me telling them is not going to change their mind, that this is a decision they have to make for themselves. But I, you know, as I said, on my, on my optimistic sunny days, I would like, I believe that people can make those informed decisions. Um, but Levi may have more pessimistic views. I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it at that. You know, I think it is incumbent upon us to, to try to help people better understand um, and to let them make their, you know, come to their own conclusions, you know, because, you know, it's, it's what I think um, someone was saying is that, you know, this person used to be normal. And they were suddenly turned into this dark side. Well, I would like to believe that they can be turned back um, through, mm -hmm. you know, through the power of education mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, conversations and, you know, reasonable, um, yeah, people can, I, pe I, I, I like to believe people can be educated. You know, Mitch McConnell seems to have. <laughs> <laughs> he's showing he's showing some hope finally he is showing you know at least, from a, <laughs> certain, at least you know, from a certain perspective and, and his wife elaine chow was the first member of trump's cabinet to resign at least in this past week that to and me it, shows something positive I, I i will say though um you know if you if you do have an instance of someone close to you believing in QAnon, um you know despite how maybe unbearable they might be um my, my my biggest word of advice is always keep them close the worst thing you can do is alienate them uh and and mm -hmm. push them further away because then, then they just uh, go further and further down the hole um mm -hmm. and sooner or later all they have is them and the conspiracy theory so right you need to tether them to reality even if yeah. you might be their last hope right um, how about a question from Marta and Bill, and then from Suzanne and Brian, and then Lisa, Elizabeth? No. Uh, I was wondering, um, do you think um, uh, a belief in uh, evangelical sort of things, like like the rapture, does that uh, does that predispose you to believe in QAnon, or or is there any significant overlap between those two groups? You know, it's always hard to say if like one thing particular will predispose you to it. Um, there, I mean, there are a lot of similar elements um, to to rapture 
to the a rapture-esque event uh, as there is to, you know, the, the great awakening of QAnon. Um, and, you know, there's also this, like I said, this biblical imagery to it. There's this, um, you know, hearkening back to, um, you know, grand prophecy, uh, also, you know, biblical uh, language. So, yeah, I, I, I'd hesitate to say if that immediately predisposes you, but, you, you know, it very well could. Yeah, and then you know, even the idea of, of what they're calling a great awakening. I mean, this is, this is a term that at least in the United States goes back to what the late, uh, the uh, 17th century, mm -hmm. right? It was, you know, used um, uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards in, you know, early 18th century Connecticut was using it. It, it kind of reemerged again in the mid 19th century with the evangelical preachers in what was called the burned over district of Western New York. Uh, they saw this second great awakening. So again, it's, it's, these, it's these themes that are, that are deeply rooted in the culture that, uh, that, that new theories are utilizing those older beliefs. And that's one reason why they are finding such resonance because they are you know, deeply embedded in 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 the way that some humans feel and act. Uh, Lisa, are you seeing some other questions in yeah. the chat or? Did Mar Marta and Bill were next? If you unmute yourself. just had our turn. Oh, you just, you were finished, okay. And then Su Suzanne, Brian, I see Brian sitting there with Suzanne. Yeah, hi, how are you? Um, well, thank you, first of all, for putting this together. And, you know, I wanted to say a special thank you to Levi. If you're on a FBI watch list, you know, thank you for doing this work. <laughs> um, I don't know how you stay grounded either. I mean, if you're ensconced in this, uh, you know, this world. But I guess my question is um, that, um, you know, uh, talking about your uh, fixed source being Q, is there any talk within that community? Q ostensibly is someone within the government, his administration, I guess, who will be gone on the 20th. Is there talk about what happens after he's gone, that fixed source? I mean, well, on, honestly, it doesn't matter. I don't to think that. he'll go away, I don't think. Um, well, one of, the, one of the most interesting things that I found is people who believe in Q don't care who Q is. It's very, you know, it's, it's very much the interest of, you know, people who cover, you know, might report on Q, might write articles on, on Q, um, knowing the identity of them or her or they. Um, but, you know, QAnon adherence uh, to them, it's, it's, you know, it's like, why would you challenge the word of Q? You know, it's like having, like you said, that, that kind of fixed source that it's just, there and you absorb it and you follow it without asking the question despite the whole purpose of it is asking questions and doing research you're not actually questioning who who q is um where will it go after after trump um uh who knows honestly i mean you know just the other day uh one of the the wider spread q non conspiracies uh that was circulating around twitter um, after Trump gave his his you know speech his, his video recording on, at the Resolute desk was that uh, he was actually communicating to people in Morse code, um, and that he had put some sort of secret message out there in Morse code. Uh, what that was uh, wasn't elaborated on, but uh, that's that was circulating around. So, um, you know, there's there's still the belief that Trump's hanging on. I guess uh, I guess oh, we'll see what happens after read, the twentieth. I just read today that there are other prophets who have who have claimed you know in the christian community that are that he will stay in power after the 20th or by the 20th so i do wonder what will happen to the whole conspiracy or the whole thing when god has spoken and yet biden is now president what happens i mean and is there any historical um guide i mean even what not you know i don't want to have world war ii again to prove the nazis wrong um, about their conspiracies, but you know, is there any historical guide as to how these conspiracies theories end and dissipate? Hmm. Hmm. Jim, can you think of? Uh, yeah. uh, well, they, you know, that's the thing is, 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 is what defines folklore is they don't, 
you know, they, they um, folklore persists. You know, this is the major difference between folk culture and popular culture. Popular culture is changing all the time. The number one hit song changes, you know, week to week, month to month. Um, folklore <laughs> persists. <Yeah. laughs> Uh, it remains and it, and, and it will, you know, it may have ebbs and flows, but it will, it will reemerge at some point, you know, but in a, in a slightly different form yeah. uh, be, because it's not always uniform and, and, you know, that, and because people are not making this continual corrective reference to a fixed source, they will use the, um, use the ideas, but it will reemerge in a different form. I mentioned, you know, I've done a, a lot of work on outlaw heroes the same legends about Robin Hood reemerged and they were used for Jesse James. And then 70 years later, they reemerged for John Dillinger. One you know, tangible example is that Robin Hood, Jesse James and John Dillinger, all they, they, were, they were you know on the lamb from the law and they stopped at the home of a friendly farmer or you know, some, in some rural area. Uh, the farmer treated them well, gave them a nice meal and after this, and, but, but the person, you know, the farmer did not know who their guest was, but as they were cleaning away the dishes, they found you know, money under the plate. It's a legend believed to be true. And it just keeps reappearing uh, uh, from time to time. And so these legends will, you know, legend stories believed to be true will, will keep reemerging. So they will never, be eliminated, but they'll have their, you know, ebb and flow. Um, but, but, and, and this one, you know, it's, it's only been what, you know, three, you know, less than four years uh, uh, since this has been, and it, it, the other point you mentioned about if this person is in the federal government, they may leave after January 20th, not necessarily. Most federal employees are not political appointees. They're part of the civil service and they'll remain until they retire. Uh, so again, depending on who Q may be or they. Is there a possibility that it's actually Trump? It is <laughs> Trump, like, man, you know, managing this, like he in the, you know, past used to, you know, pretend to be his own public- I think he's smart enough. Publicist and um, I know he takes advantage of the situation for sure and feeds off of it. Um, yeah, so Lisa Noel, Elizabeth, we have to unmute you. Okay, can you can you see me? Yes. I don't know. Okay, I'm in bed because I don't sit up right now. I'm pretty sick. Uh, I was thinking about all this. I was thinking about how to thwart uh, thwart the legend, and. Uh, I long ago, when I was a teenager, I used to study her, uh, oral poetry and heroic, oral epic and heroic song with a man at Harvard named Albert Lord, uh, who many of you who are in folklore will know. He he wanted to prove, he followed a line of people trying to prove uh, that the Iliad and the Odyssey built upon oral epics and folklore and uh, wanted to look at the things that and so in in his process of doing that he went spent a great deal of time in serbia and what is now croatia collecting a very live oral epic tradition there and in the course of it by the time he was studying it it was definitely part of the iron curtain and what he found was there was a deliberate attempt within the soviet union counter a lot of the oral epics there which were highly nationalistic they i mean what happened a thousand years ago lived strong in the oral epics that were being recited and they were very subtly and he thought very cleverly trying to shape the oral epics by inserting themselves into the stream um i mean i gather that that this is a there are street there are ways that you can collectively participate in QAnon through your own interpretation, through perhaps the use of algorithms, through uh, 
deviant legend cycles. If I were with the CIA or some subversively clever group, and there are some groups like that, do you think there's any way that one could subvert, uh, subvert the legends by entering into them? <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, I think that the um, kind of the um, um, the world of QAnon is so diverse and yeah. widespread that I think it would take more than, you know, one agency like the CIA or, or you know, as you said, kind of the USSR to uh, to to shift the algorithms or however you know however the word is spread. So no, I think I mean that's that's one of the that's one of the great you know it's, it's sort of the genius of the internet is that it cannot be controlled by one organization or group. It is it is too diffuse. But if it's so diverse, can't there be lots of diverse threads that could come in and sort of become more interesting than what's supposed to be the controlling thread? Hmm. I suppose that's theoretically possible, but I'm not. But, but I would say very unlikely. Uh, well, you know, yeah. I, I would also say, I don't know the right word to use it is, but I guess you could say that the genius of QAnon is that uh, how flexible it really is as a as a conspiracy. Um, I, I I you know wouldn't even say it's one conspiracy. It's a broad umbrella of conspiracies, and it just adapts. Um, it's that's why it's been so successful the last few years it's been up and how how much it's it's grown is because um, you know it just kind of takes all these other conspiracies that people are already thinking about or predisposed to and uh, somehow incorporates them into the broader Q conspiracy so yeah uh, that that makes it an even stickier kind of situation I'd say yeah I mean that and the idea of flexibility is also uh what was the group um, um, called the Millerites, right? Named for William Miller, who had this prophecy that the world would end in on a certain date in 1843. Well, you know, they were they were prepared. They were expecting today the world will end, and it didn't. And then they were just, you know, oh, they said, well, we we kind of our our calculations were off a little bit. It'll happen next year. <laughs> so you know, that's kind of the flexibility that that you do to keep to keep your adherence. Um, uh, still believing, you know. It, you know, it was it was called the Great Disappointment when the world did not end in 1843. But they recalculated. But you know, after a number of times, you know, they just. Um, I think yeah, I think they predicted it would end in 1844, and it didn't. And so Th there was another, there was another guy who did that in the last uh, last decade. I, I forget his name, uh, but but he kind of had a similar thing where he you know uh prophesized the end of the world the rapture uh several times and each time it didn't happen of course uh that, that's kind of also persisted until modern times <coughs> well we had some more questions in the chat and <coughs> questions and comments um adam adam is uh or you have one uh oh tim hi tim Hello. It's Susan Haley's name, but that's Tim Haley. You had a question? Yes, well, a couple of thoughts. Uh, in December, in the early part of December, they uncovered a guy, I shouldn't say, well, I guess it's unmasking a guy by the name of Q, who was an IT specialist in the, uh, in Citigroup, some in a town in New Jersey. And that seemed to quiet the drops a lot. Uh, in fact, I don't know that they've, have they come back uh, since then? So he's been dark since uh, December 8th, I believe. Yeah. Well, there you go. That's the, wasn't it the Immaculate Conception? It was something like that in December. There was a moment called the December the 8th. But uh, I was going to say also, some of these things are triggered uh, in people who are suffering some serious lack something happens in their lives and something or something is taken away. Sometimes it's a child, but something happens that, so I'm trying to be sympathetic. I have one uh, person in my family that is a Q uh, adherent 
and I, I don't know really what to do. Uh, and that's why I was trying to find out more about this. But I do find that the only better thing to do instead of arguing is going back to um, times when uh, it wasn't so awful before the bad news and to return and find some way to get back to where it was before they were damaged. Um, in this case, it was a person lost a child uh, taken away, not killed, not died. So there's a chance that the child can come back, even it might be many years later, but still that uh, potential has a way of uh, returning, as you say, Jim, that there is some retrieval possible where otherwise you just give up and just don't talk to them or block them or do whatever. But that's, I don't think, a good solution. So anyway, I just wanted to insert that thought. And I was just interested if what, what's going to happen when Q is uh, XQ, you know, if he's not, if he's not uh, pumping it out, what happens to the mass? It's going to be interesting to see. Maybe they'll just keep on going. I don't know. <clears throat> yeah. No. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, you know, it's the great question. I'm, I'm curious to see what's going to happen in the coming weeks, you know, um, where Q is going to go, if it goes at all. Um, but it, the, the sad thing is it, it does seem just so entrenched right now. Uh, it, you know, seeing kind of the extent to that it's it's gone for some people and some communities online, uh, you know, it's almost unimaginable at the moment for it to just disappear. So uh, sadly, you know, I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon, but uh, we'll see. Yeah. We had a lot of questions in the chat, um, but I don't know where to start because there were so many and scrolling through. Um, where is there thing? oh go ahead tim uh, i just want to thank you lisa for setting this thing up and levi levy and Le levi and jim thank you for uh taking the time to put this into some format uh yeah we give you the the uh the quaker round of applause uh yeah, thank you tim good to see so you thank you very much yeah um, Jed Lackritz asks, is there a tradition of folklore being passed down by an ostensibly single figure like Q? There's a lot of interpretation that happens among Q followers, especially the ones who call themselves bakers, which I never heard of. But much of that interpretation comes from prompts by the Q account. This was sent to me directly. I can put it into the general chat uh, if it's it's probably easier that way. If I just send these things that way, there's just a lot of them, and I don't want to miss people. Um, Book living passed down by an ostensibly single figure. Um, well, uh, uh, well, I would say, you know, that uh, for it to become folklore, it has to be shared among members of a group. You know, if it's if it's just one person, then that's you know that that's that's kind of idiosyncratic. So that, you know, to me, this is the difference between a between a folk artist and uh, kind of outsider art, or what's sometimes called outsider art. Um, uh, for example, there's a there's an amazing work of art at the Smithsonian, um, created by James Hampton, that is called the Throne of the Third Heaven of the Nation's Millennium General Assembly. Uh, James Hampton worked as a custodian for the GSA, the General Services Administration, and he had this belief. Uh, he saw himself as a prophet. And what he would do, you know, that as a custodian, he would collect old light, he would collect light bulbs that had gone out. He would collect aluminum foil, tin foil, silver foil, gold foil, and he would wrap the light bulbs and wrap things in, in this foil. And he built this throne in his garage, the throne of the nation's general, uh, millennial general assembly. Nobody knew about it. He had no followers. Um, 
somehow the, I, I think when he passed away, the owner of the garage found it. And it was right here in Northeast Washington on H Street. Uh, and they notified the Smithsonian to say, do you want this? And fortunately, the Smithsonian said, yes, we'll take it. <laughs> and they did. And they installed it in the American Art Museum, where it still is today. Um, some people call it folk art. It is not folk art. James Hampton was an idiosyncratic artist. He developed this art on his own. He had no followers. It was not shared among members of a group. It was not even passed from person to person. Uh, so, you know, to answer your question about, is it possible for this one individual, a single figure? No, uh, there, ha there, there have to be followers. But still, you know, go to when when the Smithsonian reopens, go to the art museum and look at this. It's amazing art, but it's not folk. You know, it was called folk because it was not fine art. He was not an, you know, he was not a trained artist. That doesn't make it folk. It's individualistic, idiosyncratic, not folk. But bakers, I don't know about bakers. Hmm. I'm I'm also not sure about Bakers actually I haven't I haven't heard of Bakers. It'd be interesting to hear what would who, who Bakers are among the Q followers. Um, but also regarding the first bit, you know, I, you know, I in, in kind of going through QAnon and also kind of being a child of the internet um, and knowing a bit about 4chan for for several years and what 4chan is and what it's created. Uh, you know, you you kind of look at Q almost. Um, and especially like the very origins of Q and what what Q was saying, almost almost like coming out as like, well, they posted on 4chan, but like uh, kind of as like an almost collective conscience of some of the darkest pits of 4chan. Um, and you know, I mentioned Pizzagate before. Um, Pizzagate was also a, a conspiracy proliferated on 4chan, um, and there are even roots beyond Pizzagate um, that connect back to Pizzagate. You know. Um, the the idea of pizza um, being alluded to as child pornography is, is what came from 4chan. It is a, a widespread 4chan thing where um, the acronym CP um, stands for child pornography. But what people in 4chan started doing was calling it cheese pizza, um, and so that acronym started, you know, being turned into cheese pizza. Harder to I guess find, and also became kind of a meme in itself. And then culminated in Pizza Gate, you know, the child pornography sex ring, you know, being, you know, uh, ran out of a pizza parlor in, in Washington. So, um, yeah, so sometimes I look at Q and I just kind of think that it, it's almost, yeah, this kind of machination of 4chan and the dark recesses of the internet. Okay, other questions for Jim and Levi? Well, I see, one from, I see one from Adam about are there yeah. particular patterns or profiles regarding geographic location, demographic, socioeconomics for adherence of QAnon? I don't think there are any particular geographic locations. Um, you know, I think uh, you can, you know, certainly throughout the country. And I don't know, Levi, if there's anything that would just differentiate between urban, suburban, or rural areas, whether there are more adherents. I think they're fairly widespread. No, um, although yesterday, I, I'd have to dig it up, or maybe it was two days ago, um, The Economist put out a very interesting survey of QAnon believers and divided up based on uh, you know race, age group, college edu educated, and whatnot. Um, not, this isn't geographical, this is a demographic, but um, uh, you know, obviously, uh, a lot of the beliefs uh, are found among, you know, uh, white, often male, uh, rural uh, people. Uh, surprisingly, a lot in, um, in young and middle-aged uh, Latino groups. Um, and this is something that's been reported on. I've seen several uh, bits on, on Vice, for example, um, looking at QAnon among uh, the, the Cuban Latino population in Florida. It's actually found quite a, a, a nest there um, among that demographic. But in terms of geographical lines, it's uh, something unique about QAnon is it's completely born out of the internet. It's you know completely digital. 
Uh, obviously, it's found itself uh, in, in real world situations um, leading to real world harm in some instances or d disruptions. But um, yeah, it's the, the community is all online, really. Are you guys familiar with, um, I used to follow um, Coast to Coast, which is a radio program at night, and they talk a lot about space aliens and time travel and things and ghosts. And I used to listen a lot to them. And there was a time traveler named J John Teeter who said there would be a civil war in the US. And he traveled back in time and that there's parallel timelines and that you know, there's some variances, but um, he's been, uh, there are theory, I've seen theories written that it's Donald Trump who came back to, to get a, it was to get a piece of equipment um, from, that was Tesla created or something, or he, he traveled in a time machine that, you know, related to Tesla uh, technology. And his uncle, John, um, Trump's uncle was a physicist. Uh, are you familiar with that? And that they say that Donald Trump's actually from the future and came back. And, and then there was a civil war. And now things are happening that kind of correlate, although the, some of the dates are a little bit off. But you should look it up. It's kind of scary. <laughs> You know the some of the similarities that happen, but it could be life imitating art, and you know, so to speak. Have you heard of that one, the John Teeter? No, I, ha I, I haven't. That's that sounds fascinating. Uh, okay, yeah, <laughs> right. Um, I think it's bleeding over into it because I've I've googled it just out of curiosity, but um. um more questions. Did you guys come across any more in the chat, Jim? And uh, well, well, there's one, you know, from Linda about what are the theories in law enforcement and intelligence about who Q is. Um, there, yeah. Well, this this is part of the appeal is kind of the mystery. You know, it's what Levi was saying about the mystery of the of the prophet is, um, you know, I think it's I think it's to the advantage of the organization. To keep the identity of Q mysterious, uh, which and and flexible, and someone has saying you know, that there may be more than one, and so it's a way of keeping this belief alive uh, that it's not tied. You know that they may arrest somebody, but then you know it it carries on. Well, it brings us back to <laughs> the Stanley Kubrick film Spartacus. You know who is Spartacus? I everywhere at the end. Everyone says I am Spartacus. You know that they will continue this rebellion against Rome because there is no one person who is the leader of the group. Um, yeah, I've you know I've I've heard some theories you know of it being um, Jim Watkins who who runs Eight Coon. Um, that's that's the most prominent one I've seen. Um, but yeah. Uh, like I said before, among the among people who believe in QAnon, it's not it's not so much of a thing. It's more of interest of the people who are interested in the people in QAnon, uh, who who Q is. So they they all at least have the one thing in common that they support Trump and believe he's a key figure in the movement. That would be the one. That's like the one underlying thread, I would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Yeah, there's a question from Jackie saying most of us think folklore is innocent. How often has it been politicized for nefarious reasons? Um, I would say you know, uh, uh, regularly. Uh, and you know, this, of course, being one example, but there are many examples. Um, uh, it's, you know, because um, that it kind of political leaders uh, will will sort of often tap into folk beliefs. Uh, you know, you may know of Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, or you know other kind of dictatorial leaders. I mean, Kim Il, you know, <laughs> uh, the the family in North Korea, you know, Kim Il Sung and Kim Il or uh, Un, they uh, they 
heavily rely on Korean folklore. Um, Mao Zedong used examples of Chinese folklore to build his following. Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, you know, a lot of these leaders rely on folk beliefs uh, to emerge as the leader who will save their particular group and in whom people place their trust because they're utilizing these these sort of older traditions. So I think it's it's more, you know, it's 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 not necessarily an exception. Um, these are these are shrewd people who who understand um, how to capture people's support and allegiance, but but you know, rarely in a very explicit way. It's more kind of tapping into undercurrents that they know will resonate. Um, Great. Um, well, this is one about what is the or what is the coming storm? Uh, Kanun is asking that someone asked before. Um, well, the storm. The storm is. Um, uh, the storm is like this. Um, I, I suppose it's the actual event um, of. Uh, well, it's it's used in a few different ways, actually. What, firstly, I, I'd say it's the event where, um, you know, all the uh, all the people are round up and and the governments, the the elites, they're all rounded up um, and and some are executed and you know put on trial and and whatnot. That's kind of the storm. However, the storm they also use the storm to reference themselves. Um, you'll you'll often see uh, and uh, you know people. Uh, you know, involved in QAnon at, at rallies or, or what have you in public saying, having shirts or signs that said, we are the storm. So it kind of like implying that it's like a, a movement of, of the people, like a, a popular movement. Um, so it, it takes a few different, um, uh, a few different, yeah, meanings. And then also, you know, you, you showed the t-shirt, uh, Levi, one of the slides had the initialism WW. Uh, oh yeah, that's, that's actually a, very important uh, if you're wanting to uh, understand QAnon. It's where we go one, we go all. You see it all the time. WWG one, uh, where we WWG one W yeah. G A W G A. Yeah, uh, where we go one, we go all. So that's also implying a you know th this kind of storm, popular mass movement. Um, yeah. And so the insurrection would be. Um... <laughs> I guess when it was happening, they may have thought, oh, this is the storm happening now. Yes, <laughs> yes. And then, um, I, I am connected to one or two people who are hardcore believers. Um, one of them is down in Florida, as you were mentioning, there are communities down there that are following it. And uh, she's posting, I'm not connected with her anymore on Facebook, but I, she is making public posts and, and I go and peek at what she's saying. And she was saying, don't lose faith. They're going to catch them all. There's, a, you know, this military contingency is headed to DC now to take over. And, you know, she's really just, but Facebook is starting to remove posts um, of people yep. saying these things. And it's just, it's just crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I just, I just put in the chat, uh, um, the link to a Washington Post article from two days ago that says, you know, that what happened last Wednesday was a QAnon fantasy made real. The faithful rose up, summoned to Washington by their leader, President Trump. They seized the people's house as politicians cowered under desks. You know, the storm had arrived. Um, so it's it's just reinforcing. But you know, again, I I remain hopeful that that uh, as we see further evidence that in fact, you know, there, there is not a group of satanic pedophiles. Um, I think people can, I, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful people will see that and will gradually return to their senses. But I tend to be optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alex Jones is a driver of a lot of that stuff. Cause I remember watching some of his stuff 20 years, even 20 years ago, Bohemian Grove. Um, 
He has a place oh, yeah. where he said the elite would go and they'd have satanic rituals with children. So, and he claimed that he was peeking over the bushes watching. Yeah, it's Scary very, uh, yeah, that, that documentary, if you want to call it that, that, that was mm -hmm. very, uh, yeah. I, you know, with Alex Jones, it's so, it's so funny to me because, you know, um, I'm, you know, I'm relatively young when I was in high school. Alex Jones was kind of like a, a new thing, you know, he just had gotten on YouTube starting InfoWars and, you know, a group, me, me and my friends, we'd watch Alex Jones for comedy, like we laugh at him and we'd, we'd say, oh, all the stuff he's saying is complete BS, you know, um, and then a few years later, as, as he started taking off more and more, some of the, you know, my, my old friends from high school, some of them slowly started to take what he was saying seriously is, it's really, uh, it's really a weird moment when I realized that, but um but yeah he he was a driver and he he was speaking um the day before uh the the sixth uh, the, you know the night before he was one of the main speakers at the protest um also you know shouting some very uh, inflammatory stuff having a chance of you know 1776 um in the crowds and um yeah yeah he's, he's he inflames all of this and he of course doesn't believe it he's just pushing it because he profits from it yeah, I think I think um, when he uh, when he had his uh, his trial with uh, he had a court settlement with his wife, I think about his children, and he had to say that what he did was was entertainment or, or something like that. I remember not not That's informative. Right. Yeah, very interesting. So, any final questions before we close from anyone else? I I didn't know, did you see any more in the chat that you wanted to address? There were so many that we couldn't get to everything, but um, yeah, well, this has been, is law enforcement looking for Q? Suzanne is yeah. asking. Right. Yeah. Do they have a guess to his or her motive? No. Yeah, what about I, Russia? I, yeah, I, th I, think I, I think I spoke to that. Um, okay, well, actually, Jamie uh, is talking about the, the Baker's book um, a manual of sorts. Yeah, Levi, we'll, we'll have to look into that. But you know, this is great that we, you know, because this is a this is an ongoing research project, and yeah. so we're really helpful that you're giving us more threads for Levi to go down deeper into that rabbit hole. So. Yeah, these are rabbit holes. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is. This has been great, and people can reach you at your email uh, with yes. your name. Yes. James.deutsch or no, Levi.boshanton. Uh, no, it's I'll, I'll put that in the chat. If you want to put Same. your emails I, I in the chat. Too. Oh, yeah, right. Jim's is deutschj at si.edu. Uh, Jamie Platt is asking, does it really matter what they believe in? Is it mostly just a need to belong to the group? Uh, I would say yes, it does matter. I mean, especially when it affects other people, you know, when, when, you know, as Levi mentioned, uh, when the guy from North Carolina shows up at Comet Pizza with a, a, what is it, you know, some type of automatic rifle wanting to free the children who were in the basement, when there is no basement, and he, you know, fortunately, he did not hurt anyone. But that has those false beliefs have have real world consequences. Or you know what happened last Wednesday, um, for which the U.S. Capitol Police, for some reason, were not prepared. Uh, you know, even though they'd been, there was plenty of uh, emails, Facebook posts, Twitter, you know, tweets, saying we're going to attack. You know, we're going to reclaim the the the, um, the people's house. They, for some reason, did not take it seriously. Those of you who are in Washington now know that. <laughs> You know, we have shut everything down one week before right. the inauguration. Metro is closing, or 13 stations in Metro are closed. The bridges from Virginia will be closed next, starting next Tuesday. Buildings are boarded up. K, between K Street and Independence, it's blockaded. Uh, so, yeah. So, we uh, have to show our ID to get into our neighborhood now with the car. Yeah. Uh, in Foggy Bottom. So, yeah, well, thank you so much, Levi and Jim, for such a fascinating program. And we look forward to hearing more from you, reading more of your articles and collaborations. It's been 
fascinating and we we look forward to inviting you back as well to do some more talks yes okay. thank you so much for inviting us it was great thank you all for attending and, and listening to yes. us and asking your great questions yes thank you to everyone and thank you to 365 buzz 365 media for recording this for us it will be on sstci's facebook page our group page facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash silver spring town center and i will also add everyone's email to our mailing list in case you're not already on it so okay thank you and and thank you to the design the illustrator of the image the photo image Dia, uh what is can you remind us of her name uh dia uh dia dia yes yeah that was great we used it in the promotion bye anita all right great yes Thanks, everyone. Yep. Stay Thank safe you guys. out there. Yep. Bye. Take care. Bye. Have a good night. Bye bye. Bye, Jane. <laughs> bye, Ken. Bye, Mary. Bye, Lisa. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Good Thank job. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Danielle. Yeah, that was fun. Bye, Yukari um, and Adam. Hey. Hi, Topic. <laughs> he hides off to the side. <laughs> okay, great. Bye, Lisa. Good to Bye, see Lisa. you. <laughs> okay, good night.